This episode of The Flush Podcast is brought to you by Federal Premium Ammunition and by Onyx Hunt, the number one GPS hunting map app. Onyx, know where you stand. Today, I'm joined by one of the best dog trainers in the entire country. Sonny Picars owns Hay Creek Kennel in Gilman, Wisconsin. His motto is to create low pressure, high energy, positive training to instill confidence in dogs and owners. His formal training is based off of the Huntsmith Silent Command System. Sonny has a wealth of dog training knowledge that we can all benefit from. But on this show, we're going to help you create a positive relationship with your dog to help set it up for a lifetime of success. Welcome to another episode of The Flush Podcast. I'm Travis Frank. I'm your host, and Brandon Morton is once again, as always, our producer. Sonny Picars is my guest today. Sonny, I've wanted to have you on this show for a long time because I've talked to a lot of hunters and dog trainers over the years, and they've all had nothing but great things to say about you and your dog training skills. So thank you for taking the time today to hop on this show. Glad to be here. Well, um, as I think you know, my dog training mentor is George Lyle, and you and George have quite a bit of history. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. <laughs> how did you meet that man? Uh, many, <clears throat> I'm not even going to say how many years ago, but it was at a, a, a Rick Smith um, Foundation seminar in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So it's got to be close to, I'm going to say, 20 years ago. Gotcha. And we've uh, maintained a relationship and pretty much been friends ever since. Gotcha. Well, George uses the Huntsmith uh, silent command system that you train with, which is what he has taught me. Uh, and now a lot of the friends that I know that have uh, puppies, they're using that as well. Can you explain, kind of give me and give our listeners an overview of what this training system is? <clears throat> well, every everything that I'm currently doing today, I would say, um, is inspired by the Huntsmith uh, silent command system. And most of it has been for me from Rick. Um, where we've gotten it today is kind of a low pressure, high energy format that for me has, is really more importantly working with the people than the dogs over the years. Um, the, the dogs get easier and the, and the people get harder. So it's, it really, really is about trying to help the, the human, um, interact and understand the world according to the dog. Hmm. How long have you been training dogs? Uh, this is a uh, 2000 was our first year uh, professionally. Gotcha. And you also offer guided hunts in the fall. Is that correct? Yeah, we, um, we've got a, Oh, a Hakery kennel outfitter and uh, we, you know, we Montana, Wisconsin, and then primarily my biggest part of it is in, in South Texas for the winter, January, January, February, and uh, this year we're going to be doing, oh, a good part of November and all of December. Gotcha. So your your kennel is based out of, it's Gilman, Wisconsin, is that correct? Yep, Gilman, Wisconsin, yep. And it sounds like you're not there very often. <laughs> we're, we're here from now, right now, our season starts, uh, dogs come in tomorrow, and okay. then we're here um, the whole summer, um, and then we start to travel Oh, mid to late September. And um, we're back from South Texas. <clears throat> First part of March, we just take some mental health time and then start all over again. Do it again for another year. Now, does this, because this is something that you obviously it, love, you enjoy, it's a passion. Has training to this level taken the joy out of it for you? Or do you still find joy in what you do? No, I still find a lot of joy. Um, I love working with the baby puppies, developing baby puppies. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of joy. It, uh, needless to say, I do not set an alarm clock. <laughs> gotcha. Well, you brought up puppies and I think, you know, you and I, we were talking the other day and I feel like, you know, there's just so much that we can dig into, uh, when it comes to training dogs. But I, I think it's important to really focus on where everything starts right that foundation that relationship that you build with your dogs so 
Um, before we get into talking about just puppies, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Like, is it ever too late to work on the foundation with your dog? No. Um, the only, the, uh, the negative is you only have X amount of years left, you know, based on the age of the dog. But, but no, mm-hmm. I, my experience has been, there is no age that you can't start and accomplish a bunch of things. Gotcha. Well, on the other side of it, then, is there ever a point where it's too soon to start training with the dog? No, well, um, absolutely not. We, we are starting training just as soon as we can get our hands on them. So if we whelp the puppies, you know, we're starting stuff at, uh, you know, at a day old and <clears throat> the research and some of the stuff that I've been, oh, I've been learning. Um, there's even things that are, that are happening within the womb that is imprinting and, and can develop puppies. So no, there is no age that that's too young. Gotcha. So when people say, well, they're just a puppy, let them be a puppy. And then, you know, maybe next year we're going to start the formal training. What are they missing out on if they wait? Yeah. So in, in my opinion, that that's, that's a, that's a huge mistake. So, um, from the world, according to me, Mm -hmm. if, um, spend as much time as you can spend with them and then keep in mind that when you are spending time with them, whatever it is they're doing is what they're learning and you're the one doing the the teaching. So, um, I try to maintain just discipline over myself to when I am going to be with them, try to teach them something, um, be excellent, be fair, be efficient, and just try to teach. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't play with them and have fun with them because we do. um, But we do try the the time that we spend with them, we want it to be quality time, you know, based on structure, rules, discipline, even though they might be, you know, just a little bitty baby they're the rules still need to, to apply to some extent. So let's, let's take it from the top, then, if you don't mind, what do you what do you start out with? Uh, when, when you've got a puppy and you start the training, what does that look like for you? Well, for me, I try to basically take over where the puppy's mother left off. So back to those boundaries, some structure, some discipline, um, you know, big picture to, uh, the most important thing that I have with puppies is just to, uh, to have them be still. Um, and that's more of a mental thing than it is a physical thing. Mentally have their mind still, uh, when their mind is still, they can be open for instruction. So they're much easier to teach. So, um, that, that's a big, big part of what, what I try to accomplish. And <clears throat> along with that, a lot of different scenarios, different outings. Um, nobody loves to hear the word stress, you know, stress your puppies. But in reality, that, that is what we're doing. Um, different situations from spending time, you know, in the dog trailer to being in the kennel, to being maybe in a whelping pen, to making a visit to town, going to the post office, going to the hardware store, um, separating them, bringing them back together, you know, just anything and everything that we can expose them to on the ranger, off the ranger, um, going for a walk, water exposure. Um, we do a lot of different scenarios to, to, expose them to different things as babies. And your goal there is just to create a well-balanced dog that can really adapt quickly to any real life situation. Absolutely. Yep. To, uh, gotcha. and that's, that's where the, the, tr- um, I don't foresee myself. I'm not a trainer anymore. I'm more of a teacher or a mentor. So it's about showing the puppies anything and everything that they're going to experience later in life and then try to help them mentor them. Um, through everything that is going to stress them. Gotcha. And, so this, yep. we, we had an interesting conversation the other day, um, you know, and you, you brought this up and I, I want to talk about it because I think it, it's extremely important. You said that in your career, you've seen a change in the relationship that people have with their dogs. And you said, I believe I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that it's it, in a lot of ways, it can be unhealthy for the dog, right? What is that? Yeah. What is the change that you've seen? Um, that I don't know that I've got it 100% pegged yet. Um, but, but I will probably say the people tend to be, to be selfish. Um, you know, and this is every day I'm trying to learn more to help the people. So, you know, the, the people are selfish as far as I'm concerned, based on wanting to take from the puppy, but not wanting to give things back to the puppy. And the the puppy needs structure, boundaries, 
rules, discipline. Um, so maybe today they're more of a pet, um, you know, more of a fur baby. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I don't know that it's necessarily the best thing for the puppy. So a lot of what we've done training wise and how we've, you know, rebuilt the facility has been to help the people where the people are at with their view of their puppy today. So it's just a different individual than it was, say, you know, 20 years ago, as far as the people that are working with the dog. It used to be, we, we might have, you know, one individual own five or six dogs. And at the end of the day, he was hoping, you know, basically to, uh, to have the best um, out of those five or six and then turn the other two into somebody's house pet. Um, today, the individual gets a dog and it is going to be their dog for life. It, it, it is more of a family pet, um, big part of, you know, the big picture with their kids. And I got no problem with it. I think it's a good thing, but we've lost connection with really who the animal, you know, what drives the animal, what the animal is, what their end game is. What is the animal's end game? What drive, what should drive them? Well, I think, uh, you know, food or as crazy as this might sound, uh, food, sex, and danger, you know, they, they want to eat and they want to reproduce. And with doing those two things, they can end up in trouble, you know, with uh, maybe interacting with another pack, maybe interacting with other, with other individuals, with other dogs. So, um, you know, back to the, their, <clears throat> their end game is they're a little more primal. Um, and we tend to not see them as, as being a, a dog or an animal. We, we tend to see them as, you know, our, our, our fur babies that uh, want to spend time with us and enjoy us. And in reality, they, that's not necessarily how they see it all the time. So what's a, what's a healthy way for that dog to learn from their owner? Structure and some boundaries and some discipline, um, being fair and deficient. Um, maintaining control over your own emotion is probably the absolute biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, not to get overly excited, but then not to get overly upset. Just, just try to maintain being in the middle. Um, and, and instruct and teach and mentor without a lot of emotion coming into the, uh, into the big picture. I think so, most people, most people would, would probably chuckle to themselves hearing that because that's gotta be one of the hardest things as a dog owner that you can do is to just stay flatline there, right? To not, yeah. to not be too far one way or another. And it's funny because when I first started training, that's the first thing George Lyle told me, uh, you know, is to try to take the emotion out of it and just, you know, be calm through this whole thing. And he laughed and he goes, I've been trying for 30 years. So just take it easy on yourself. You will make the mistakes, you know, but, uh, you know, and I keep trying to go back to that because I think it's so important. And I've learned myself just the importance of staying calm there. But he said, he kept going back to you and Rick and Ronnie and, uh, he just would say, you know, how you guys are able to stay calm. So, Sonny, what are some tricks that you've learned that help you to stay calm in the chaos of, you know, the training and anything that can go wrong with the dog? The, the, the first thing is if and when something does go wrong uh, and you can't control that emotion, just quit. Get away. Take a break. Go do something else for a few minutes and then try to come back at it. Try not to push um, – to try not to push through it. Just, just take a break and get away. Um, that, that's important. And then, um, for me, um, cause I've, I've had the same emotion and the same excitement that everybody else has had, but to do it professionally, you, you know, it's, it's about trying to make some money. And if you make mistakes, it costs you money. Um, so I maintain it just by, by trying to do it for a living. And then the byproduct of what I have seen, my emotional connection and the, the, how I interacted with the dogs, <clears throat> once I got control of that, well, the whole relationship was different. Um, it was just a completely different, uh, just a completely different relationship with, with the animal. Um, it was amazing. It made my hair just stand up. It was so much deeper of a relationship. Now you did lose, a, I did lose a little bit of the emotional connection, but um, it was, it was so much more dog-like. It was almost like the dogs allowed you to be part of, of their world. So that was, that was quite the experience. Well, and that, that's, you know, they, they're a pack animal, right? So they're looking to you as their leader and to have this healthy relationship, you need to be a good leader, right? Or we need to be good leaders. Yes. Being, being fair and efficient. And, um, if, if you're not going to lead, they are. And typically, 
with the baby puppies, which we all get, they're just not mentally prepared to deal with that task. They don't, they don't, they just don't have it. Um, so of course they start making decisions on, on their own. And, and a lot of those decisions can be bad because we're not there to teach. So you teach, um, you know, I, I, would you say that your, uh, specialty would be the pointing dog breeds? Yeah, it, that's how it started. <clears throat> um, but you know, where we're at today, we, we work basically anything, whether it be Shih Tzu, St. Bernard, I mean, anything that comes through, we work and it, it really isn't, there's not much difference in the program. I, I work with the, with the house pets the same exact way as I would work with my highest of high end bird dog, you know, dog that I use on my own personal guide string. It's, it's basically the same exact program. And it's, it's really nothing more than building a relationship with the animal to trust you. Um, not on necessarily uh, on a loving relationship, but more of a, a fair and efficient, respectful relationship. Um, and one, once you have their mind open to, to learn based on a good working relationship, you can teach them things literally in, 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 in you know, maybe even in seconds, not even minutes. Um, they're, they're so open to learn once, once there's a working relationship where they have some respect for you. And the respect is not, for me, it's not based on trying to dominate them. It's trying to teach them, um, opening up their mind to learn and, uh, build confidence. So we, we build a lot of confidence through accomplishment. That, that's a big, big part of what we're doing today is, um, is building confidence through accomplishment. So back to that stress, you know, we might put them in stressful situations with, with what we have now is what would look like agility equipment. So it's hard, it's steep, it's narrow, um, slippery. And then based on accomplishment, we build confidence. And that, that's a big part, uh, that's the hub of my program today. When you say you build confidence, um, I know a lot of people that, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of different methods, right? A lot of People, they want to include treats. Some people say no. Uh, to build that confidence, how do you reinforce after a dog does something that they did a good job and that good, you know, to just so they know that they did it right? So to, to back that up just a little bit, so we start the process with building a point of contact with a command lead, which if you've hung around George, you, you have a pretty good uh, idea what that is. And it's yes. basically being able to communicate to the animal through the lead based on touch. Um, so we build the point of contact based on touch and then we challenge the point of contact with agility or a, or a challenge. And then uh, as they accomplish the challenge based on how we're touching them, the real reward isn't necessarily coming from me, it's coming from them through their accomplishment. So how we, how we uh, reward their, the desired behavior is almost just being neutral. Um, not a lot of excitement, but then a lot of, not of, not a lot of anger. So it's very, very neutral, very, very slow. Um, you know, some more words would be methodical, uh, very quiet, um, showing a lot of compassion. Um, so that is my overall demeanor when I am working with whether, you know, young dog, old dog, it doesn't matter, just the dog. And, uh, then through touch is where they really do feel that praise. That's what that's what I've been using. George passed this on. I mean, it's it's the Hunt Smith training or Hunt Smith Silent Command training system. So we're we're using similar techniques or the same. Um, I've not trained with you, but based on what I've learned through this system, yeah. Once at once at my dog Daisy, once she accomplishes something, you know, and she stops, I walk up there, I just rub the side of her legs uh, or her back, and don't say anything. And that's her way of knowing, okay, all right, I did it right. And that, is that what you're saying by the touch part of it? Yeah, that's, that's, yes, that is. Now there's a bunch that does come with it. Um, but yeah, primarily that, that, that's, the, that is what happens that the touch, um, the acceptance, the acknowledgement, there's a bunch that goes on there with when you're in a dog's personal space and, you know, are they, are they receptive to you being in their personal space? Do they embrace the fact that you're there? Are they fearful of you? You know, there's a bunch of things that, that can go on. Um, and then that's what we're working with to try to put them mentally in a spot to where they do embrace our touch and they do enjoy being with us because the more that they, uh, the more that they can embrace it, the more open they are to learn. And that, that's uh, yeah, that's how, it, that's the program. 
Got it. Okay, so we we touched on this right away. We kind of we, there's so much to talk about, but you mentioned it starts by getting them to stop. Once they stop, they think. So let's let's go back to almost the beginning here to developing this foundation. How do you get the dog to stop? Whether it's an eight week old or a two month old or a six month old or a twelve month old, what what's your technique? Uh, giving them something to follow. So that that that's us, you know. And, Baby puppies, it's 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 just seconds. I mean, there's their, their attention span is is zero, um, but it's giving them something to follow. So if if I'm still, they're still. Uh, if I move, they move. Uh, with baby puppies, those workouts are extremely short. You know, seconds of just being still for a second, and then as we move, um, try to try to encourage them to follow with a with a lead, um, and then just as time goes on, it gets longer. Um, a lot of uh, table work with just our hands on the baby puppies, just physically handling, touching the baby puppies and, and teaching and mentoring how to be still. Gotcha. Well, can you explain that when you set a dog on the table, what, what's going through your mind, what's going through the dog's mind? Um, well, the dog wants to, the dog wants to interact, jump, play. Um, that's just natural for the dog. What, uh, what I try to do is just literally relax my own mind and my own body to give them something to follow. So the, the calmer that I am, the quieter that I am, um, they tend to just follow that. Um, picking them up and setting them down will take their feet out from underneath them so there is no place they can go once they're picked up. Set them back down, and as soon as they relax, you turn the pressure off, and, the, and they, they'll embrace it. They learn from it. And there, there again, that's, that's the touch. They don't understand English. So to try to talk to them at that age doesn't make any sense. So we're trying to communicate based on how we touch, whether it be our hands, whether it be a lead. Uh, there's just multiple things that we can use to communicate to them. Once they stop, puppy, maybe it's just a second or two, right? Um, how do you uh, reinforce that's a positive thing? But for me, it's then movement. So then we'll move them around on the table. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe even play with a ball, you know, play with a, with a, with a, t- with a toy, um, the prey drive kicks and they want to chase it. And then from there, take that away and then go back to having them stop again. And then as soon as you get a one count or a two count of being still, we'll then loosen them up to move again. Um, and they inst- instantly will learn uh, what it is you're wanting. Gotcha. So th- when you get this puppy, it, it starts right there. You get them to stop. Now you take it into the next stages. How, how many stages do you typically have, or, or what's your progression with a puppy from that point? If you can get the puppy to be still and go with you, you've, you've pretty much accomplished you know, 99% of what has to happen. So um, if you get the baby puppies to be still and follow you at a baby puppy, they'll, they'll do it for life. And everything is everything hinges on that. Everything is connected to that. Um, the, the going with is is nothing more than them paying attention. So it's not it's not necessarily a turn left, turn turn right. It's just go with. Uh, pay attention to what it is I'm doing and 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 follow. So it's it's way more of a mental thing than it is a physical thing. Gotcha. So I got my puppy last year, the right at the end of August, early September, and she was already just about six months old when I got her. So I missed six months of training with her and she developed her own habits. Uh, she lived in a completely different atmosphere, but I can tell you, Sonny, <laughs> I don't know if George has told you any of the stories, but I had a, a bold, I have a bold dog with incredible prey drive that wants to run big. And I had to, I had to basically take her and we had to build from scratch uh, yep. to, to <laughs> form that relationship. And I, I feel like I missed out on so much because you talk about, you know, if you get that puppy to follow you, to go with you, you know, you've got that for life. Well, she already developed her own habits. I had to take them out and say, no, we're doing this together. What's your advice for somebody that gets a puppy or a dog like I did where later on in life? And where, where do you want to start at that point? Do exactly what you did with, with starting over as a puppy. Um, they, they accept that almost instantly. They're, they're happy to start over. Um, they're, oh, what would the words be? They're, uh, they embrace it. 
because now they do have a good leader and they want to follow. They naturally want to follow. So their learning is accelerated when, when you start over. That there's nothing lost with that whatsoever. Now they will, they'll buck back a little bit and they might protest a little bit because they do have their own system and they like the way their system is working. Mm-hmm. But once the connection is made and you've got the relationship going, they're, they're very, very easy to teach. Yeah, I've, I've been amazed at just how far she's come over time in the repetition. Is there ever a point in a dog's life that you say, no, nope, good to go. I don't need to train with this dog anymore. Or do you, I mean, I imagine they, they learn so much and you don't have to spend as much time with them, but do you ever stop the training? No. And the, 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 the training really isn't training. It turns into a way of life. So, so for, so for me acting, you know, interacting with my own personal dogs, it's not, mm-hmm. uh, the training doesn't really ever end, but it's not really training. It's just based on how we live. Uh, it's based on what we do. So I'm with them seven days a week. Um, they're doing stuff with me seven days a week and there really wouldn't be any, any, what anybody would see as training. It's just how we interact. Um, uh, examples might be if they're if they're taken for taken to free run just for exercise uh, i'm going to be turning left maybe turning right to get them to follow so it's not yes it is a free for all but the free for all still has some rules and some boundaries no different if you take a dog to the to the dog park um yes it is a little bit of a free for all but there still has to be rules with the free for all. So we might get to the dog park and there we go back to the stopping or the being still, you know, be still at the gate or be still coming out of the car, coming out of the truck. And then from there I cut you loose and then you need, you need to go with. So if I want to go to the right, you need to go to the right. If there's, you know, uh, a scenario that I don't want you uh, involved with or need to pull you out of, I can, I can turn a direction and get you going with. So it just turns into a way of life, you know, the, the no barking, the being still when I go to feed you, um, being still when I go to handle you or touch you or, or groom you or trim your nails. Um, it's just, it just is a way of life. Um, it, I, I've noticed very much what you're saying with my dog because we have these rules in place and I always kind of in my mind wonder, you know, she loves to play in the backyard with my kids. She doesn't run away now. But she is curious because she has this strong prey drive. So she's smelling. There's birds, there's rabbits, squirrels, whatever. There's a raccoon that came by the other day. She's got all of these smells and she's curious, but she knows we're not hunting. We're not working. I'm always wondering at what point do I need to give her that freedom? And then how much should I be able to give her? Is there a a recipe for that? Uh, It's based on the age of the dog. Uh, that, that's a, that's a part of it. So, you know, that, uh, that two-year-old dog is a teenager. That three-year-old dog is probably coming into some, into some maturity. If there's been good rules and, and a good relationship established from day one, everything, everything comes considerably easier. Um, but for me, there never is 100% freedom or where I'm not going to pay attention because that is when they are going to get in trouble. So I'm, I'm trying to maintain some kind of order throughout their whole life, um, right? You know, right to the point where they're retired. Just, gotcha. just trying to maintain those boundaries. So I want to talk about you know the silent command and the point of contact. Um, but before I do, and the reason I bring this up is because we're talking about the freedom that we can give a dog. A lot of people that have dogs that don't live out in the country, maybe they're in a neighborhood. Um, they maybe have an invisible fence or uh, now there's wireless fences where once your dog gets to that certain distance, they're going to get that, uh, that electric jolt if they've got the collar on. Now you train with the point of contact and does that interfere with the training method to have a dog that's trained that they know when, when the collar is a constant pressure, they stop. If it's tap, tap, they turn. If it's tap, 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 they come back to you. Now, if you add the, um, the underground fence and it's a shock, does that change any of the training? Is that a bad thing to have? Nope. My, my experience has been if the dog understands the rules and the boundaries with the fence or with the collar, it's all situational. So okay. 
there's absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. I've, I've had really good luck with my clientele and, and yard fences. Now there has been some disasters, you know, starting dogs, <clears throat> whether they, whether they might be too young or just not a good understanding of what to do. So they will freeze up, you know, maybe in that zone uh, with that yard fence, or they will run through it. Um, and then my clients will come back with, you know, they're, they're just, they're so determined to get out that they just run through it or, or they get, they get stuck in the zone and they're sitting there with the, the stimuli going off. I don't believe that that's what's happening. I don't, I don't believe that the dogs are trying to defeat us or just, you know, muster up enough courage to run through it. They've, they've just not been taught what the rules are. So mm -hmm. we've had really good luck with that without any misunderstanding from the dog whatsoever. It's all situational. They know the okay. situation and they know what to do, but they need to be, they need to be taught first. Yep. Do, and that, do you have... that goes back to being still so that they that they can learn mentally be still so I can teach. Gotcha. Do you have a age when you uh, introduce the e-collar or an, an age that I would uh, say, is it too early to introduce at a certain point or do you base that on the progression of the dog, each individual dog? It's uh, it's each individual dog. Um, their mental state is a big part of it. And then their maturity. So, so my personal dogs tend to mature faster and that that's that happens from them just not being as much of a pet to me they're more of a working dog so they do mature faster um so with that being said each each dog is different and uh, we will go ahead and, and apply that collar pressure or transfer those points of contact based on how they're doing um that six, eight month old puppy, I might have my foundation sometimes maybe even complete, but I might not use it until, you know, maybe that second season um, to where we're going to formally really finish the process. Gotcha. Do you think I made a mistake by hunting my dog last year at six months old? Absolutely not. We, we get them out there just as fast as we can. So this, this year we had a whole, you know, a whole crew of, of baby puppies in, in South Texas. Uh, they showed up there, the youngest puppies probably being, you know, eight, nine weeks old, um, had another group of puppies that I'm going to say probably was 13, 14 weeks old. And by the time we left South Texas at the end of the season, um, those older puppies were, you know, running, handling, pointing, backing, you know, their own cubbies of birds. So no, I don't, I don't think there's, there's a, too young to start them now cover and things can dictate that to overwhelm them but as, as long as you know you're putting them in situations that they can handle and learn from i think it's all positive yeah i've i really noticed when i had daisy out in cover that you know shorter grass where i can watch her and i, I think you get this you build this relationship with your dog that you can almost anticipate what they're going to do right so i would say oh she's going to do and i i could see her and i could whoa, we could stop. And, you know, I'd walk up to her and redirect her or, you know, make a command for her. But if she gets in that thick stuff or cattails, or, you know, thick brush, I can't see her. That's where I feel like I really struggled the most. And I think you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think as she experiences it more and more, I'll be able to develop more trust in her to do the right thing without me being involved correct absolutely and that's where the real go with uh comes from when you can trust them to actually go with without having to manipulate them to do it so yes that the cattails that is a major challenge um heavy cover um lots of brush lots of trees those are all major challenges and <clears throat> We try, I try not to put those dogs in those situations unless I do have good points of contact. And then as they mature and grow and really learn the rules, now those points of contact, uh, they're almost never used. So that dog goes into that cattail slough or, or gets behind some trees in South Texas and, and you're expecting them or needing them to, you know, show to the front and maybe to the left. Yeah, with time, they are to the front and to the left right where you need them. So the, the trust is there. And that, that trust could be, you know, at, at 50 yards in the grouse woods or, you know, maybe 450 yards in South Texas. Same dog can do the same job and, and still go with you. Is there a certain point in a dog's life where you, I mean, all the dogs you've worked with over the years, is there, you know, if somebody is working and working and 
putting in all this time and seeing the results, is there a point where that dog should reach their absolute peak potential? A point I in their life, so. I should say. Like, yeah, is there I, I it, on so. average? On average, is it two years, four years old, one year, one and a half? I mean, what would you say on average is this is when your dog is probably going to be at their very best? You know, if my experience has been they they continue to learn and they continue to perform. Um, I think when they do reach their peak or when they go, get past their peak is when their body starts to maybe break down a little bit. I think each each year they just keep getting better. And then, of course, as they hit that that six or seven or, or eight or nine, you know, when they're some arthritis maybe will set in or their body starting to break down a little bit. I, I think that's that's when they start to change. But uh, up until that point, I think they continue to keep learning and they keep thriving. But, you know, if there was if you're really looking at a number, you know, I would say for me and, and what I've experienced with my own personal dog and the dog that I've worked, they probably that five to six, maybe even six to seven is where they're really at their at their peak of their performance. Gotcha. I can see from when I got to Hazy at six months to where she is at 12 months, it's like I have two completely different dogs. And I had a lot of people that saw this wild dog. I mean, we'd be out, we were out in the Badlands and she ran a mile and a half away. I mean, she just ran through every possible command. Her prey drive is so strong. She wants to go. And I just, this dog would not would not hunt with us, would not stay around, wanted to just sprint as far away as fast as she possibly could. And it happened several times. And and I had people say over and over, you can pull a, a rope back, you can't push it. Just trust the process, trust the process. Well, now I'm seeing the results of it and I can't wait to get back out in the field with my dog. We went this spring uh, before the birds uh, got on nest and just took her out. And just her instincts took over. And it goes back to the foundation that you talk about all the time, that George talks about all the time, that people that use this training method, they they don't focus on the dog's instinctive ability to hunt. It's that dog knows how to hunt. It's mom and dad gave it that instinct. You need to teach that dog the foundation on how to hunt with you. And then yes. everything else takes care of itself. Yep. Because that when, when she was that age and she was running, you know, that mile or whatever it might be, um, there's a lot of frustration on, for those dogs. And they're, they're running just to run. You know, basically, they just the wind is just whistling through their ears. And it's due to uh, there's nobody there that's fair and efficient. There's nobody there that is that good leader. So now you're seeing, you know, six months later and you're, and you're starting to see this magic. It's because you've, you've done your part. Uh, and that's, that's where you're giving something back. You're, you're giving her something to follow. So now she has you there to trust. Therefore, now she can focus. And that's where you're starting to see the magical stuff happen. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that makes my hair stand up when you, when you start to hit those, those breaking points to where they, you, can, you can see the improvement and you can see the real dog start to pop. Mm-hmm. I've still yeah, seen that, a lot a, of the it, – oh, it's so special. And I've seen some – some of the amazing skills, which I think this, that my dog has. Uh, but I've also, you know, the next day I go out into a field, similar situation. There's another dog there. And all of a sudden it's like, I have a completely different dog again. Like what happened? I know you're still a puppy and we've got a lot to learn yet. And it's, we're, it's a process, but is it pretty typical for a dog to run a field differently when there's another dog out there that is there competition in their mindset? Absolute competition. Yes. So they, they, they will start to compete amongst each other. And, and probably if they were left alone long enough, they would form their own pack. Um, there's going to be a number one and there's going to be a number two. And throughout that process, you kind of just got bumped right out. And I think that's a very natural, normal thing. Um, just because they're a dog and, and we're a human. So yeah, there's a lot of competition. And then I'm, uh, for me, I, I allow a lot of that stuff to happen. So I'm not the guy that's going to, you know, get down on them or, or try to stop it. Uh, I try to allow that stuff to happen. And I try to allow it to play out so they can learn what the rules are. No different than, you know, coming up on a, on a deer or, or say a, a South Texas hog, um, off game. We really, I try to allow them to have the experience rather than, than, you know, teach avoidance or a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, just, just 
try to let them interact and, and see that it is, you know, just another dog or could potentially be just off game. And most of the time, um, they overcome it or, or leave it alone all on their own. We're, we're just hmm. there to kind of help the process a bit. Um, can we go to a little bit of in depth on developing a point of contact? Because that's really where you can eliminate the screaming and the yelling at your dog. And can you develop the point of contact with all dog breeds or is it really focused to, you know, a pointing breed? No, no, it's, it's all dogs. Uh, just to, you know, a Shih Tzu, you have to have a smaller lead to, to be able yeah. to build that point of contact. And how the, you, uh, <clears throat> how, the teaching how is you, coming from the release. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, how do you develop it? Where does it start? So the, 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 the learning starts from the release. Um, and I, I hope that makes some sense. But uh, as you cue, the dog doesn't necessarily understand what it is you want. When you do get the desired behavior, if the desired behavior would be just to stand still, the pressure is completely turned off. So they're learning from the release, not necessarily the bump, 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 or the tap, tap, tap with the lead. The, the learning is coming from when that thing is turned off. So that, of course, then the, in their mind, it's like, oh, that was easy. If, I, if I'm still, you turn the lead off. And then the lead or the, the point of contact is not there to be um, – it's not there to be intimidating or it's not there to be dominating. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just more of a, a battle of wills, if you will. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a battle of wills. It's a patience game. It's, it's who can outlast who to teach. When you say the and lead, I, I hope that makes some sense. I, I, I'm, yeah, it's, it's, this is one of those things where I'm sure this is why your seminars are so valuable because you can demonstrate it versus us talking through it. But it's essentially, do you call it the wonder lead, right? Yep. Wonder lead, command lead. Okay. And essentially it's kind of, you know, there's different variations that I've seen, but it's the slip, right? So as you pull, it tightens up. As you release, it loosens around the dog's neck. And that's where you develop that point of contact, right? So if your dog is walking and you want to stop, it tightens up. As soon as they stop and do what they are supposed to, then you release the pressure that you're talking about. And then at that point, you can take it steps further. And, you know, what I, what I use, and you probably do the same, Sonny, is, you know, tap, tap is just a very subtle touch that they can feel. And that's to turn, right? And to hold yes. it, pull it, you know, where you apply the pressure and it's to stop. And essentially that eventually transfers into the e-collar which you apply those same tap tap or the constant pressure and your command lead now goes from two feet to 50 feet to 100 feet to 100 yards to 500 yards or however far you want but the dog learns that they can do you know they're hunting and as soon as that pressure they stop is if it's tap 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 they're supposed to come back right and now you've eliminated yep a hoarse voice at the end of the field when you're out there running and it's magic. It's like magic, Sonny. It's the most beautiful thing. I've hunted with a lot of guys that scream at their dogs all day. And I'll be honest, last year trying to teach my dog and working with her, there were days where I left the field horse too, but I'm seeing it now. And that's a beautiful thing. And people hear e-collars or shock collars and they think, Oh, I'm just shocking my dog. Well, I've put that collar on. And my dog, you know, on a number two on my Garmin remote, I can't feel it, but my dog can. And it's so subtle, but she yep. feels the tap, tap, and she just comes right back. I don't have to say anything. People that don't know or understand dogs, they're like, wow, that's just magic. <laughs> and I laugh and, and I think, you have yep. no idea what I went through for six months to get to this point. <laughs> sure. And it's, um, um, you know, it's all situational so that the dog is just, the dog is keying on to what's happening. So if you're, if you bump and you, and you're moving, well, that's just the situation is the dog looks for direction. When you're using the collar or you're using the lead, all that's really happening is you're referencing the spot. You're, you're interrupting the thought process. Therefore the dog looks for instruction. So now it's just, it's based on a situation of what's happening. If you're not moving, that dog is going to come to you. If you're, you know, you're going left or right, that dog is going to move left and right. And the, uh, 
to be real, uh, that fair and efficiency with a lead is is less is always more. The softer that you can touch, the better off you'll be. Um, but I don't mess around with, say, a number one, a number two, a number three, a number four. I'm always I'm always trying to stay on a number one. Uh, and then once they understand it, then we go to a correction that might be, and I'm talking about a lead right now, then that might be, you know, like a number three or number four. So it's going to make a pretty good statement, but mm -hmm. they've already learned that the teaching has been, they, they, has been, they know what to do. Mm -hmm. So going from a one to maybe a three or a four, and then right back down to the one, it's very important that you go right back down to just the absolute softest that you can touch them. Is there a point that, you feel people can over direct or over command or give too many commands to your dog when you're out there hunting? Yes. Um, for me, it's, it's about, uh, to, to start with, don't be giving command that you can't reinforce. So, um, don't put yourself or don't put the animal in a situation where you're going to give a command where it's where they, where you can't follow through. Um, and then I'm real big on allowing, allowing the dog to make decisions. Um, I love them to think on their own and make decisions. So <clears throat> once they're efficient, there's, I use, I use almost no voice commands because they are efficient and they know exactly what to do based on what the situation is. Um, and then too many commands just will desensitize everything. Then, you know, they just won't listen to anything because they've just heard it so much. It means nothing to them. So all this conversation, we've been talking for probably 45 minutes and we haven't said one word yet about a bird, introducing a bird, right? And sure. you, I think you agree with this, that to really get a good dog that you're enjoying being with and hunting with, they have to be obedient. So it all comes down to the foundation. I think what we should do is, you know, we could get into, if you're okay with it, another conversation or multiple conversations about how to introduce birds or, you know, guns into the situation. I mean, there's so many layers to the training of a, of a dog, but right now, you know, it all goes to the foundation. So what are you, uh, what are you working on, on the programs that you have coming up? You said that you've got dogs coming in tomorrow. What does that mean for you? Um, there's, we got baby puppies that have been dropped off here over the last couple of days. They're probably, I'm going to say eight weeks old. Um, so we're doing bird introductions and puppy developments on those dogs. Um, there's, there's older dogs that are coming in that have never had a puppy development that will do the same exact thing with those seven, eight month old dogs as we will with the seven or eight, nine week old dogs. So it's, it's, it's about exposing them to birds. And then there's some puppies that we've had in Texas or dogs that might've been worked last fall that have had a bird introduction. Um, their instincts are all, you know, they're turned on, their prey drive is turned on. And then we're primarily will be working with their foundation. So uh, for me, it's important. They have to have a bird introduction before we start the foundation. So they, they have to have that desire to want to you know, catch it, kill it, and eat it. That, that's a big deal. They have to have that stuff turned on. They have to have purpose. They have to have um, a turn on switch to know that when they're cut loose, that they are to search and to try to find game. Um, that's where you go, you know, goes back to that rope you're talking about. It's, it's so easy to, to reel them in, but it is so hard to push them out. So that bird introduction, if it's done properly, by the time you're done, you can't catch them anymore. So when my clientele calls me or you would have called me last year with that dog that's running off on you, that just makes me smile because that <laughs> gives me something to work with. Now, I know it frustrates the daylights out of you, but for me, that's, that's just that makes my job so much easier because the dog actually wants to do something. Um, so that, that's awesome when they, when, when they do want to go. Um, and then we build their foundation. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it, they enjoy it. I, I really do think that they do. I, it's, it's not about the bird. It's, it's about working and building that foundation and getting those points of contact built. And then from there, we go back to the bird work, but now the bird work is a little more controlled. We're starting to teach, you know, some manners, if you will. Um, and then they're, they'll be coming up on their first year as a, a, a legitimate bird dog with a, with a foundation. How, if somebody, let's say I got a puppy and I was scheduled to bring it out to your place. How, how long do you have your hands on that dog before you send it back home? Um, the, the baby puppies that we have here right now, you know, they're probably, I'm going to say somewhere between 
maybe 10 and 14 weeks old, we'll just spend a couple weeks with those puppies. Um, and what we're doing throughout those couple weeks is, is exposure. Um, exposure to the kennel, exposure to the <clears throat> to the chain, exposure to the truck, exposure to the field, and then of course a lot of exposure with birds. It's very bird intense. They're they're interacting with birds every single day. Um, they're run individually, and then they're also run as a group. So their instincts, the pack instincts, kick in. But then of course we don't want them to be too reliant on their litter mates or their you know the puppies of their age, so that we run them independently to start to work on just that, their independence. Um, so there's a lot of structure, lots of stuff going on. And then their, their owner will come pick them up and we spend, you know, a lot of time with the owners. Um, you know, sometimes it might be half of a day. It's, it's based on just how much uh, you guys are wanting, you know, to get it. it Mm -hmm. I will, I'll stay here till it's dark with, uh, with trying to help. So then we send you guys home with a bunch of homework with those baby puppies. And what I'm really, what we're really trying to accomplish there is to help you help you get the puppy going in a, in a good, healthy direction. Um, you do your work, which, you know, it, it, most of it really is your work at the, there's not much really that I'm doing on my end besides offering up opportunity. The real work is coming from you guys, from the, from the owner. Mm -hmm. And then as that dog hits, you know, six, seven months or they call with i can't catch him anymore he won't listen well then we'll get them back in and then we'll that's when we'll build the foundation and then those puppies will go into this bird season as a as a puppy but it has a foundation so that we can you know catch them and stop them and and control them hmm. i've had some people uh reach out to me because you know i've talked openly about my experiences with daisy and this bulldog that wants to run big insane prey drive i've had other people reach out to me and they're like i can't I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep my dog. I don't know that I can take this stress anymore. My dog keeps running away. Um, everywhere we go, it's just, I'm constantly worried that my dog is just going to bolt. And I'm like, well, how old, you know, and it's, we talk a bit about it. Um, but you know, it might be a two year old, three year old dog. I can see mine now she's one and she I mean, that's completely gone from her. She's not running all those horrible things are not horrible, but those, you know, she didn't know the boundaries. Um, in, I think we said this earlier in the conversation, but it's not too late to work with that dog, right? Absolutely. You know, we, I would say, I would say probably 90% of our clients that come here with what it is you just explained. We don't know if we can keep this dog. It's, you know, it's, it's, this is not what we signed up for. Things are not working. Yeah. <clears throat> I would say that we, that we probably, it's got to be at least 90% where it is never, it's never really a dog issue. It's a human issue. And if, uh, if the, if the human will do their part, there is, there's 100% success rate. It's, uh, it's just, cool. it's just not that hard. It's, it's just simply the, the, the human uh, does not understand what the dog is saying. And as I work with people, the, the one thing that just always comes back is that nobody's ever explained it to me like this before. You know, I never, I never knew this before. So once we give them just a little bit of knowledge, um, the dogs almost instantly respond. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a it's, lot of fun. It's, it's rewarding. Fun. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say it's, it's very rewarding to see the effort go in. And I'll be honest, I, I know a lot of people that drop their dog off and the dog comes back and trained and, you know, this obedience and stuff, but to do it yourself and you see this all the time, I've seen it with, with my dog. It's totally doable, but it really comes down to the knowledge, right? You have all this knowledge, Sonny. I'm fortunate that I have a friend that has so much wisdom, George Lyle, that would share that with me and help walk me through and understand what's going on through my dog's mind that I can do this together. Um, it's funny because I was out in Montana and we were on a hunt out there and I met Custis Coleman and you know Custis very well and work with him. And he laughed when my dog chased after a bird. And George was the one in command of Daisy at the time. He was just, just not, he didn't even bring a gun. He's like, I'm just going to work with her in this field. And that was the day Custis met Daisy and he was laughing and he's like, if you don't want her, I will take her. And if you don't I'll, take her, Sonny take will her. take her. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you have a dog that uh, some of the best trainers in the country would love to have. And I was like, that's great. I've heard this from, yes, wonderful, you guys, but she's currently a mile away, right? right now and I yeah. can't do anything 
about her. But so, as you know, this this conversation we've just had right now, you and Custis are actually working on videos. He, I had him as a guest on probably two or three, I don't remember, four months ago. But he he told me that day, and I didn't know it, but he's he was working on what's called the Upland Academy, which is a training series using all of your the Huntsmith Silent Command system and taking it from start to finish, but putting it in to a video format. So how involved with that are you with working with him? And where does that stand right now? Uh, very involved. I, I do believe he, the next date he's coming back out will be in May. Um, he was just here, <clears throat> actually, uh, George and, and Custis were here just a couple of weeks ago. We were working on, uh, oh, we were just getting it rolling. Um, mm -hmm. So very involved, very excited. Um, I, I have not been this excited about something for, for quite a while because I really do think with what he is putting together that that uh, the human, today's today's client, will be able to literally um, break it down, you know, step by step, clip by clip, video by video, and really, really, really uh, be able to work their own dog to its full potential. And that, that is the part that excites me. Um, is working the animal to its full potential. So I don't care what the breed, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, not all dogs have, you know, the same potential, but if it's a, if it's a Shih Tzu, you know, let's work it to its full potential. If it's an English pointer or an English setter, it doesn't matter the breed. Uh, it's working it to its full potential. Uh, that, that's what's, in, that's always been real important to me. And with what he's, what we're trying to do, that's going to be possible for the, mm. just the general public to take their time at their pace and, and work their animal to its full potential. And ultimately what that really ends up, what, what happens with that is the animal gets quality of life. Uh, it gets peace. Peace is a real big thing for me uh, to try to express to my clientele that their dogs have. And I don't care, you know, how many days a year they hunt. I don't care if they hunt at all, or if they hunt, you know, 60 to 80 days a year, the dog has to have a sense of peace. It's got to have a sense of uh, just quality of life. Um, without anxiety and without all this frustration, you know, it, uh, so that's a big deal. And I, I believe with what we're working on, that's going to be accomplished. So it's very, very exciting. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the videos. I just talked to Custis the other day. He's, he's excited about where they're at. And so the Upland Academy will be live online. And did you say June, early June? Is that what he's aiming for? For, so just so a few I, weeks away? Yes, I believe so. Excellent. Well, um, I know there's just going to be an incredible amount of information and value to anybody. It just takes the time to watch it, listen to it, learn it, repeat it with your dog, and you will see the results. And obviously, Sonny, I can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom with me, uh, with everybody here today. I know we talked about foundation today, and there's a lot more to talk about. I would love to have you back on and dig into some other aspects of teaching the dog and working with them and birds and and just getting into those details uh in the meantime hay creek kennel people can go do a search there to learn more about your operation uh top notch first class in every way everybody that i again like i said at the beginning of the show everybody that i've talked to that's worked with you has had nothing but great things to say and hopefully uh people took and uh, quite a bit out of this conversation. Uh, do you have any any final thoughts as people head into the summer months? A lot of times I know people take training off during the summer, but this to me seems like the time to work with them, right? Yep, absolutely. You know, that, that uh, just going back to if you're going to spend time with them, try to teach them something. Uh, that's That's so important. Just just continue to teach because the more they learn, the more their confidence is built and they, they feel... Uh, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment. They just, they feel good by, by being taught. And it, uh, you know, the simplest of simple, you know, jumping in the truck, jumping out of the truck, um, just look for instruction, just be open for instruction. That that's so important. So I greatly appreciate all your, uh, your time and your effort here. Thanks, Sonny. We, we appreciate it a lot more than you, but, uh, I hope that everything is a success uh, as you start up another season at your kennel and we will definitely be in touch again soon. And once again, thank you to Federal Premium Ammunition and Onyx Hunt for helping us to make this show possible. Be sure to download the Onyx Hunt app before your next hunting adventure to find out why it's one of the most valuable hunting tools available today. 
We'll be back next week with another episode of the Flush Podcast. I'm Travis Frank reminding you to take the time to introduce someone new to the field. <laughs>